All right, happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome back to another Learning Tech Talks where we are exploring the landscape of learning, workplace tech, and you know what, all sorts of things under the sun. So today is going to be, you, you might have seen some of the posts leading up to this. We're gonna be going a little bit in a couple different directions. We're gonna talk about customization versus configuration, which is gonna take us a little bit down the rabbit hole of, of how to think about integrations, APIs. This might be a little bit of a technical conversation, but we're gonna try and keep it light because the reality is this is something everybody's dealing with right now. And it's something that if you're not, you should be, because as we talk about bringing work or learning closer to the flow of work, well, part of the way you do that is you better integrate into the flow of work. So uh, to help me ha navigate that conversation, I'm joined by Rob Porter You're from Coso Cloud. So let's kick things off for those of you who are, are joining us, watching, comment in, let us know where you are. You shared with me right before we went live, Rob, where you're located. And so you're in the rural, rural parts of Idaho, right? Yeah, North Idaho, uh, north of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Beautiful, okay. beautiful part of the country. All right. Now, is that in the like close to the mountains? Like, where where are we at there? Uh, I'm about a mile and a half from a paved road. Kind of give you an idea. Wow. Okay. All okay. right. So yeah. you're yeah. All right. Well, I I grew up in the sticks of Minnesota, and I can tell you right now that um, I empathize with trying to keep your car clean. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The car wash yeah. company, uh, I should have an open credit with them. I was going to say, yeah, that's one of those things where if you care deeply about having a car that doesn't have dust or dirt on it, probably not the probably not the best place to be. But um, sure. well, I'm I'm where I always am here in, in Waukesha. Background, I don't think has changed in, you know, what? I take that back. My background has changed once in the three years I've been doing this show. And it was because I moved my desk to a different part of the room. But that's about it. <laughs> so anyway, um, like I said, we're gonna be we're gonna be going deep into this, but before we do, Rob, tell me a little bit, you know, kind of your background because this is one of the interesting things. If people see this, you're you're the head of market and business development, right. but your background really is in learning and development. So a little bit about you, and then how that led you to Coso Cloud. Yeah, sure. I've been in adult education for a little over 28 years. And so there's a lot of gray in my beard and there's a good reason for that. Uh, <laughs> I started, it's funny because I did start out when in uh, working, if you recall, CompUSA. Uh, in this oh, industry. wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? All right. So, yep. so the uh, Microsoft Office uh, training, I had managed training centers, worked on global training centers, moved to uh, Portland, Oregon uh, a while back and managed uh, on a national level the, the training okay. programs that they had. So okay. very technical uh, yeah. training, then. Technical training. So, yeah, okay. it did, had done uh, the Microsoft Office stuff, a little A plus, a little MCSE, you know, got into that and then managed, got into managing instructors and locations and so forth. Yeah. OK, got it. And so, so now you're at Coso Cloud. And right. when when people ask you Coso, like, right, obviously cloud based, but we're not talking the weather here. So, right. so technically. How do you describe what the remit of COSO Cloud is? So COSO really stands for completing the solution. And that's what we oh, do. Oh, really? Okay. okay. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Uh, I like, by yeah. the way, I also like how you snuck COSO or how they snuck COSO into the cloud. For those of you who are watching right now, now's the time you might be all tabbing. But um, when you get a chance, look at actually the like little drop logo thing. It, it took me a bit, but I was like, ah, wait, C-O-S-O. -O. I'm like, I like that, but because it, it looks right. exactly like a cloud, but very subtle. I like those kind of design Other. elements. I do too. I do too. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so what we do is, is we've been in managed services for quite a while, but really for enterprise businesses and large government agencies who require a secure virtual training solution to perfectly okay. align with the business, you know, their needs. This is what we do. And we we provide a, a tailored training solution with uh, private cloud managed services might be incorporated. We solve issues like branding, delivery challenges, regulatory requirements. Okay. So unlike commodity type training solutions, we ensure a very, we focus on high impact tailored virtual solutions that okay. We focus on high so security and compliance. Well, so let me ask let me ask you this because this is helpful. Because mm -hmm. I think about this sometimes, especially when you're dealing, and I've been uh, in a number of different industries around this, like especially highly regulated industries where there's a lot 
to consider. Um, would you say is the role you play in that almost in some ways kind of a mediator for them? Because it can be almost intimidating in those environments to say, sure. oh, let's go do an RFP for a new plan. And you're like, I don't necessarily maybe even understand the full complexity of the environment. Is that in some ways the role you play to say, let us help you bridge that gap to make sure we're accounting for all of that complexity? 100%. Absolutely. Okay. We do a lot of consultative work with organizations to truly understand what it is that they're they're looking at. Because I mean, the security is definitely one of them. Uh, learner journey, how are we going to make this happen? Uh, and what does that look like? And what are the steps? What are all the, the different points along the path that we have to take in consideration? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I want to get into this because that, like I said, this is part of a big part of the conversation is this, the security and privacy behind it. But this is really going to stem from the conversation around what's the difference between configuration and customization and is there a place for that because i think in many regards as things moved into the cloud we almost swung the pendulum from well everything used to be highly customized to then it swung back to well now you can't do anything but configure. and there is a bit of a myth that oh you can't do anything but configure which yeah. which isn't true but before we get there one of the things i want to talk about is you're you're in kind of this unique position because you're your, your market and business development Mm -hmm. with an l d background which is a little bit unique even just in my own exposure to business development teams and i actually think it's a unique opportunity because we talked about this before going live mm -hmm. we're a really kind of odd i don't know if odd awkward organization to kind of partner with and i've been on the other side of it i've been on well no i haven't been on the sales side but i can only imagine it's not easy for sales folks to navigate learning and development if you haven't had some had some exposure to the complexities of it. Hundred percent, absolutely, hundred percent. You know the the thing is too because we're looking at from a business development side is our goal is to make customers successful, right? And in order to do that, we have to understand what they're going through, what their challenges are. Right. And from a learning and development standpoint and, you know, my background and I mentioned, you know, CompUSA and, and doing that. But I've I've run a company before uh, my I've been an instructional designer. I've been an instructor for Captivate, Storyline, Camtasia, so forth. So I understand the questions to ask as far as do you really understand your audience? Right. Yeah. And and how do we partner with an organization? And the best way to do it is to really understand what their audience is going through and how they can serve them. Well, because like we said, L and D's is quirky. I mean, it's it's quirky and it's not because I think we're not the only ones. But sure. we are the audience, but we also aren't. We also serve a greater audience. And so this whole, mm -hmm. well, what are our needs and how does that balance with the needs of our end users and and how do you walk that line of, well, we want this, but does the user really need this, which we run into all mm -hmm. the time of like, well, are we pursuing things for our own benefit or for theirs? Not that, yeah. So I, I have to imagine, and for anybody who's watching who is on the vendor side, I've I've been a big advocate that for business development people, mm -hmm. a breadth of exposure to the complexity of our work is extremely helpful. I have to imagine that has been helpful for you, <laughs> especially in the Absolutely. security, privacy. I mean, especially in that space, but I think mm -hmm. in general it does. Right, no, and, and, and the perspective really is, is that, we're here to serve those who serve. I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, the LMS is serving other people. And so we're here to serve the people that are orchestrating that that, ex that entire experience. Okay. You know, it's funny. I was, uh, <laughs> I love the way you said that. We're a service organization, which I, I remember one time in a, a panel and I mean, we were talking with some other learning leaders and there was actually almost a visceral reaction to that. You know, it was like, no, we're not, right? We are, we are a business strategic partner. And I'm like, okay, service is not a bad thing. And and I and I hate when it's perceived as this negative, like, oh yeah, you're less than. I'm like, no, actually being in a service, you're an enabler. Like we should actually lean into that instead of trying and push out of it and go, no, we're completely independent. We don't serve anyone. Because we have the, I'm like, well, yeah, if you really want to isolate you from your business stakeholders, that's a great way to do it is to right, say, right, I'm not here to serve you. I'm here to tell you what to do. Right, right. Well, you know, here, here's the deal. Zoom out. Just zoom out. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. And, and and understand what the total ecosystem is, right? Yes. Okay. So let's let's transition the conversation a bit into where we were going a little bit a little bit more on the technical side. But like I said, please ask sure. questions along the way because if if we get too technical, I will try and keep us out of that hole. But if we do and you go, I'm not sure what you're talking about, then you know, right. folks comment in and, and pull me back. I'll definitely pull back or, or even revisit things. But let's start the conversation with this. How do you define, because it was really helpful for me and actually my stakeholders when I actually started separating configuration mm -hmm. from customization. It actually was a really helpful way for people to illustrate, oh, okay, I, I kind of understand how these two. So how do you define the difference between a configuration to your your learning architecture, your your system architecture, and a customization to your architecture. Absolutely. So, when we look at configuration, we look at utilizing the existing native capabilities of the product, right? Okay. So, in in some cases, you may be, hey, you can swap out a logo, or you can change this color, or you can change this font, or you can move this widget around the around the screen, right? So, I would look at that some you know in the it, through the lens of a configuration. Now, when we get into customization, we look at how do we extend the current capabilities, right? Okay. So it's great. Okay. So, so maybe there's a product out there that, that allows you to swap out a logo and change maybe the, the header or the banner or whatever. However, does it change that entire page? Can I, can I add additional effects to it? Can I add other branding in there? Um, or is that product for example, just look look at style guides, for example. And you look at an organization style guides and, and maybe the edges of, of windows uh, or pictures are squared off and, and sharp. Does the LMS <laughs> represent that, right? Are, are yep. we rounded and drop shadowed? You know, what is that what is that experience? And okay. a lot of these organizations that we work with, I mean, we're talking global enterprise organizations. They have worked very, very hard for their branding. That's how they're known in the industry. And it's okay. important to carry that over into that other experience. Okay. Got it. Well, and 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 then if you start dealing with extended enterprise, then that only further makes that that branding that marketing that much more important because now you're saying well this is going in front of a customer so our brand has has to be part of that now before we go down right. that because we again i'm telling you this is going to be we'll, we'll have to pull the rabbit back out of the hat but i am curious because you work with so many different platforms and even just my exposure to it mm -hmm. i've seen a trend with configuration um there there was my perception and i'm curious if you're seeing something different is for a while there, the configuration was extremely limited, right? When things mm -hmm. first started moving into the cloud, it was extremely limited. Like you said, you could maybe change a logo and the banner color at the top. And that was about right. it, which felt extremely restrictive. I mean, it was great if you were an oh, yeah. administrator, because when you got all the requests for like, can we do this? Can we do that? You're just like, nope. <laughs> right, yeah, no. I can't, no I literally can't. Right. I can only do this one thing. I've seen this pendulum swing a little bit more towards the middle where a lot of the platforms and tech that I see now, they have some more robust configuration capabilities than they have in the past. You can do more than swap a logo, maybe change that. But wh where are you seeing it now? Is it is our organizations really kind of leaning into this configuration or do they kind of draw a line at a certain point and then say, you, you want to go beyond that. Th this is outside our game. Right, right. Yeah, you know, it, it gets to a point where it, it's how much of an impact is it in the experience, right? And how large of an audience are we dealing with? And, and I, I see very large organizations who have a small audience for a specific, let's just say pet project or limited focus, right? And yes. so they're like, we'll just deal with what we got. We just need to deliver the content. That's it. And then we have to look at what what is important, right? Okay. Is, is it is the content a box to check, right? Like, hey, they just they just completed. Or are we looking at building an entire ecosystem, right? Are we looking at building an environment so that people are encouraged to continue? And I think where we see the areas that organizations are looking to do more customization are when the content is important, but voluntary, right? Okay. 
Okay. So if you're at, okay. Well, and I think this is helpful for people who may be going through this experience. Because I mean, honestly, I can, can't count the number of people I know who may be implementing a new platform or going through some sort of RFP process in this. And this is one of those questions where you look at the configuration capabilities mm -hmm. and sometimes, um, and, and I've seen companies kind of get bad mouth, you know, well, why, get, why don't they let us customize everything? And it's like, well, uh, you, you don't understand the engineering resources that goes into this. If you expect, you know, some major ed tech platform to allow you to basically retool the entire, they just can't do that and maintain right. the product. So I understand why there's some limitations. But it sounds like from your side, where you're seeing that kind of need to go, configuration's not enough. Now, I do want to kind of push on this a little bit because I've heard these battles go back and forth. And I think there's dangers to getting into some of the true customization work because you are starting now to build, you're starting to build on to something that is now really attaching you to this. So how do you help continue to kind of balance that line? Because if you ask some people, especially stakeholders a lot of times, mm -hmm. they want it customized, totally customized because they don't understand the implications. So to them, it's absolutely full customization, bend this thing into whatever. And they don't realize till three years later, uh-oh, we've made a monster we can't, we can't undo. So how do you help navigate that line so you don't end up in that mess? Right. Yeah. So I, I think what we do is we take a look at how they're communicating with their audience now right? Like what okay. works, right? And because one of the things that we don't want to do is we we don't want to create such a change, such an awkward, we don't want friction in that in that learner journey, right? Okay. So, so if we look at it through the learner experience and what is that end result and what are they going to get out of it? And that's this is also kind of where that merge with business development and instructional design come together, right? Okay. Be because we want to look at we we want to look at what the stakeholders' goals are. We want to make sure that they're totally aligned, and along with that, what can we get done with the existing product? And sometimes, you know, I use the examples of branding, you know, initially, but it's not always about branding, right? It's about well, and that's where I was going to ask. What are some other good use cases for this? Because there are definitely times where you'll get people who will push and go, "Well, we want our branding on it," and it's like, "Well, but that's not always necessarily enough." of a justification to go, yeah, I mean, that's fine, but the time, effort, and resources going into it so that it looks how you like it may not necessarily be enough. 100%, 100%. I'll give you a great example. So we, um, I'll, I'll do a name drop, okay? So we, we do a lot of work with NVIDIA and okay. the, the NVIDIA audience, uh, historically, the communication and, and education and sharing of information historically has been through YouTube. And it's okay. been this live stream even event. with employees. Oh, even with employees, but we're talking about like enthusiasts. We're talking okay. about people that. Well, are yeah, I mean the gaming. Right? The gaming culture is very much. I mean, I used to be a part of it. Yeah, you were either in right. Nvidia or you were in ATI, and right, that's right. You didn't yeah. cross lines. No, 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 not at all. But I mean, we also talk about education of like, what about all the Best Buy employees? What about all the people that are in retail that are selling the product, okay. that they have that experience, that they understand what motivates, what drives. And frankly, a lot of those individuals are also enthusiasts of the product itself, right? Yeah. So so historically, the communications and, and the trainings and you know that sort of point to point uh, knowledge transfer had been through live streaming. And that was, okay. you know, that was a great, so that was an existing, so, that was an existing medium in the organization, which again, it meets the culture because that, that gaming culture is big. Mm -hmm. I mean, people line up for the newest NVIDIA product coming out, just like they do the iPhone where it's like, you're right. waiting to get that thing. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, when we look at that and so from taking on that instructional design lens, we do not want to change how they're currently, what, what's currently successful, right? It was successful, okay. but we needed to move on, right? And so we looked at that. We looked at what the learning systems uh, that they were using and how they're, how they're able to deliver. And, and there was no vehicle for live streaming, right? As a result. Yeah, which is so, probably true of anybody watching or listening that live absolutely. streaming capability is not a native 
capability in any LMS I've encountered. If I'm wrong, call me on it, folks. But I've right. I've yet to see one, and I've seen a lot of LMSs. It's not one of their priorities. No, no, it it, it hasn't. But it was an important aspect of that experience for that organization, and we didn't want to we didn't want to make that change. We wanted to continue. You take what works really well and you extend that out and then you keep adding more things to it, right? Okay. And, and, and so that's how you build, you know, build these systems and, and have this evolution of a, of a learning experience. And um, so what we did is we, we looked at that and this moves into customization because the learning systems didn't have a way to handle live stream. So what we did okay. is we were able to integrate and what we do, one of the things that we do for our uh, customizations and, and working with organizations is we create what are called, we call them headless LMSs. And there's been a, yeah. the, the, the phrase of headless term for, people would be familiar with kind of a headless LMS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So being able to bring in that live stream, that very successful way of transferring knowledge into an, uh, a structure that also would be able to handle other things, right? So handle other things like SCORM content and, and PowerPoints and, and, you know, webinars and, you know, gamifications and things like that. Like, you know, trying to merge those things in, it required some customization. Right? Okay. So, because I'm, I, again, I, I, I'm, I warned people ahead of time that we might get a little technical, which that's fine. Because I'm actually curious. Right. We won't, I promise I won't go too deep with it. But I'm actually really curious with this because when people hear a headless LMS, I don't necessarily know that that necessarily, while we said that may be a term familiar to folks, it, it may not necessarily be super familiar in terms of what does that look like. So first of all, my follow-up questions to that are this, you know, is that something, because I know in RFPs and things that I've, I've helped be a part of, that is something that has been part of our exploration when looking at platforms is, what are your capabilities to do some of this? Not necessarily even right. if it's on the roadmap yet, because my experience has been not all are created equal and not all are as equally able to become a headless LMS or headless platform as others. Is that fair? No, absolutely. Absolutely. There And there is not a one size fits all. There just definitely okay. isn't. Okay. So, so with that, then when you're saying headless LMS, is the experience still being administrated through the LMS and just the end user experience is being kind of reconfigured or customized elsewhere, customized elsewhere, or are you actually then almost creating threading together a couple different things with some backend data pushes to the, L like how is that actually architectured? Right, so, so one of the things that we'll do is we'll, we'll build this experience, this learner experience and anything that administratively isn't gonna fit perfectly in the LMS, we'll go ahead and create administrative tools on the back end that, that, that for the most part, they bolt on to the existing solution and okay. they control a different part of the experience. Okay, okay. Cause I mean, I'm just thinking even live streaming for folks who may not understand how live streaming works, right? It, you you uh -huh. might think, well, can't you just live stream anywhere? And the answer to that is no. And actually I talked uh -huh. about that last week with MediaZilla because Actually, we didn't talk about this on, on stage, but we talked about it backstage was the fact that the actual API calls and the way you actually push a stream from a studio and actually, that's not something that is just any video platform even has the capability to do. So again, I'm kind of fleshing out this NVIDIA thing where you may say, well, an LMS can hold videos. Can't you just push live stream video to it? And the answer would be, I'm get, well, obviously you did a customization for it. So the answer would be no, right. you, right. you can't. Well, you, and, and there are some ways to that you could make that happen. But the question is, okay. is that is that experience, the experience, the successful experience that has gotten the organization to this stage, is that continued on? So okay. we look at YouTube, right? So for example, YouTube has a lot of little characteristics that we're all just really comfortable with, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's like, hey, I'll continue on this or hey, this or what, you know, there's some, there's some aspects of that and uh, or commenting or things like that. And so okay. are all of those components that people are, are very comfortable and have been using for years, is that still there? And would it disrupt the, the experience if we changed it? Okay. Right. Or 
are we able to continue that success into a new evolution of the of delivering learning and carry over all the things that work really really well and then just build on that okay Okay. So in other words, rather than recreating or reinventing the wheel, I mean, I guess to your point, could you technically deconstruct, I mean, granted, you'd have to get, it'd be a mess, but I mean, in theory, right? Let's yeah. say you had your magic right. wand. Could you deconstruct an LMS and build in the capability to do it natively in the LMS? Maybe, but would that even be the right thing? Because if the user experience and the experience they're familiar with is the YouTube experience because of some of that capability, you may actually be causing more damage to the experience to try and then replicate it somewhere else when it's like, that's not where people are anyway, which I think sometimes is one of the problems we see where we try and create capability in say an LMS that's like, that's not where conversations are happening. You have a, right. you have a chat thread in the LMS People don't go to the LMS to do chat. They they do that in Slack or Teams. And so it's actually right. a disruption. Right. And if you have an organization or you have an audience within an organization that is used to having these communications uh, through Slack, and if the LMS doesn't have that, is that a disruptor? And how many learners will start to drop off? Uh, one of the ways, one of the things I can, I, I will equate it to, and I'm not going to get into the exact name of organizations, but yeah. think about in, in your history of uh, times where a, let's just say a, a product changed drastically and okay. everyone was like, I, I hate it. I don't want to use it. I'm going <laughs> to wait for the next version to come out. I'm going to wait for all the complaints to you know filter through and then yeah. I'll start using that product again. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, so, so on this one, as we kind of go down this path to this, because I, I do think that one of the areas that I've seen organizations, and again, this kind of all ties back to, so if you think we're, we're going down a path that's separate, it's actually not, because we're still threading this back to this customization versus configuration. One of the things that I've seen kind of position the solution to, well, we are only configurable, um, but, and, we have API calls. We have we have custom mm -hmm. or you know integrated third party API calls, which right. I again I think are it's absolutely something. If you're looking at learning tech, yes, you should push for that and look for that because don't underestimate the effort of if there is zero existing API, you're 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 basically carving a new path. Absolutely. But that's not necessarily the end all be all solution to say, oh, well, this platform already has a integration with Salesforce or Workday. So we don't really need to worry about it. Correct. Right. That is absolutely correct. And I and I think that in some cases people overlook or they or they generalize. I say people just, you know, but they, the generalization is that um, everyone uses that product the exact same way. Right. Yeah. And that's just simply not true. You know, I could use the example of Salesforce, right? So many, many organizations love to, you know, they have an interest in connecting their learning system to Salesforce, right? And, but people use sales, organizations use Salesforce differently from organization to organization. Where is that data going? What type of data is it? How are they going to track it? Where does it, you know, and, and is data going both directions, right? And so the question is, is that, you know, is it really a one size fits all? And in many cases, it's not, you know, and, and when we look at a just a plug for us and I say completing the solution, maybe that connection does 80% of what you want to do. Well, we'll okay. just help you get the other 20% done. Okay. Well, and I, I and you, you mentioned Salesforce. Another common one I see a lot is Workday, All right? That's, Absolutely. that's a big one where... Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there's already an out-of-the-box connector to Workday. So mm -hmm. we don't need to worry about any sort of customization because that that integration is already built. And like you said, I don't think I've encountered a single organization globally that is using Workday the same. I mean, not even remotely Guaranteed. close, even in terms of the security setups, in terms of how they have security set up on Workday. So even the way those integrated third-party integrations are in existence will not necessarily cross the box. And I say that it almost as a warning to folks, because that can be something where as you go through the RFP process, you can just kind of gloss over it and go, oh, mm -hmm. Salesforce Workday already taken care of. I don't need to worry about it. We'll just kind of 
plug it together. Once we get the solution and everything will be fine. That's right. It, 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 it is overlooked as just simply a box to check. And that's where a good business analyst will come in and assist as well. And that's, you know, we have fantastic team of business analysts that really kind of go through and those questions flesh out. And sometimes, you know, we'll have the customer will say, well, okay, let's just have one meeting about this. Uh, well, then the questions come out and it's all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, we need another meeting. We, we really need to dive deeper into this because we didn't really understand all the components that, that are actually involved. So I, I to your point, I 100% agree. Okay. Okay. So let me, let me ask this, because we, we've talked about some of these different things because, and, and where I want to get a little bit further on is kind of the security implications of this, because this mm -hmm. can sometimes, you know, you can, you can run into it and all of a sudden your CISOs or honestly, even some of the, the vendors you may, I mean, this is a good question to check with, even with other vendors to go like, well, I mean, where do you sit with this? Cause you can run into some real headwinds thinking, oh yeah, we'll just go down this path. But before we do, right. I'm curious, have you run into situations where you've actually had someone go, we we need to customize the bejeebers out of this. And you've actually walked them backwards and gone, I actually, I actually don't know that that's the right. Like, are there times where you go, maybe not even not at all, but where people have kind of over assumed what they need to do from a customization. If you actually step back and gone, I actually think you may be overthinking where you need customization. Yeah, or taking on too much at once, right? Okay. And I, I and I think you know we I, we always want to respect what their goals, desires, ambitions are, and, and you know some they, and they those come from different places as well, right? They come from different parts of the organization. They come from different people within the organization, um, and sometimes the perspective is why don't we look at a phased approach? Why don't okay. we take this on where it's digestible, it's manageable, and ultimately you will be successful, right? So what I don't want them to do is spin a whole bunch of plates and try to manage everything. And hopefully, you know, all these different perhaps yeah. risks or maybe the risk are, are could, could be a wide variety of things. It could be uh, testing risk. It could be timing risk. It could be, you know, there's all sorts. So we want to take some time and work with the organization ultimately it is our focus is about reliable and accessible training. And how do we get to that point? Does that happen in three months or is that over a period of time that will ultimately get to your final goal within a year, but we okay. just have to stage this out. Okay. So is it, is it fair to say, and, and I guess this would probably be my guidance on it, but I'm curious if you have a, a mm -hmm. different perspective that, Let's say, again, I'm fleshing out use cases here. You're implementing something brand new. Mm -hmm. It may not be the right time to make all the determinations around all the customizations that you may want to do out of the gate. Because that's just, mm -hmm. to your analogy of too many plates spinning, it's like, listen, we, we got to get this stabilized first mm -hmm. and really define where there may be times, and I, I have no doubt that there may be times where you go, but there are some super urgent ones that we need to. But is that fair to say that it might be a little early if you're just in the early stages to start diving deep into customizations? You can yeah, say it, no it, too, because I'm also curious what you've seen with the, folks. No, there there are aspects. I mean, and it's it's what's coming up. Right. So, okay. so we may have an organization. It's really kind of like, you know, who's the, I'm going back to all my instructional design kind of, you know, ideas. And, and I mean, honestly, and listening to you, the process is very similar to what we should be doing as instructional designers. Like you're asking all these, what is the desired outcome? What are we trying to do? How do we weigh that against the resource? Like, how do we actually define that? And then back into what should we do instead of saying we should do this and then figuring out what the implications are. I, I dive deep into my instructional design background doing what I do, right? Okay. And it's, it's, it is, you know, what are the impending, of, what's coming up? Like, and how important is that? You know, who is the audience who we're reaching? How many people are we reaching? How are we connecting with them? What sort of devices are going to be, you know, being used? What, how are we going to, you know, put in these controls, you know, security wise? I mean, this is, okay. this is a big part, you know? So, okay. yeah. I, I think that's that's what we look at. And there are times where we say, let's just take a step back 
And there are other times where we're like, okay, and it could be something that, hey, you know what, we've done what they're asking to do, and we can just, eat, we're comfortable replicating that, right? Okay. And th that could be one of the considerations, just as if you were a storyline, you know, design uh, developer, and someone had said, uh, I want this cool animation. If you have that animation in your back pocket from a previous project, then you're like, oh yeah, hey, I feel comfortable delivering it within a certain amount of time. But if it's like, ooh, I never seen that before, right? <laughs> We've so, never done this one before. Right, yeah, okay. exactly. I mean, so there are all sorts of variables as associated with that decision. Okay, okay, got it. Um, here, here's another one that just kind of comes to mind that I would love, you know, I, because a, a lot of times what I see is, and, and I get it, and I understand both sides of the coin on this, but a lot of times there's this idea that, well, the system doesn't work the way I want it to, so we'll replace it, right? We'll replace it and get something else, and then that will fix it. And there's a time and a place for that, and I absolutely advocate for that in certain situations. Sure. But then other times... I've found people end up with the same problems with a slightly different flavor. It's like, well, now right. you have terrible tasting chocolate ice cream instead of terrible tasting vanilla ice cream, That's but right. you didn't really fix it. Are there times where you've worked with orgs where rather than even necessarily completely unbolting this, because I think so, up to this point, we've talked a lot about, well, maybe kind of you're bringing something new in and then you're deciding where people right. have gone, we have an existing system in place. We're not necessarily getting the horsepower out of it that we'd like rather than throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. Is is that an appropriate use case then? And have you seen that where you've actually been able to kind of resurrect what may have been considered a dead system through customization? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I laugh because, I mean, I've had conversations with organizations where I thought I initially was going into a conversation about talking about tailoring, you know, a, a system and their first comment was, well, we just want to know what we want to ask for our RFP. And I was like, well, wait a minute. So you're totally discounting what you have now that you've been working with for years. Um, but why? And, and that's it. I mean, it's really getting into the why. Um, and a series of questions. And I have I have another example with another organization who also was looking at moving on. And yeah. we got into a deeper conversation about it because one is I really like the company and I and I like the people that I worked with, right? So yeah. I, I genuinely want to help, right? So we got in the conversation about they're like, well, this isn't working, and our you know our our uh, our activity on the site is really low, and you know we're getting these comments and this and the other. So okay, let's well, good, good. And what we found out was that a vast majority of the audience. So the organization was looking at the desktop experience and okay. saying that's what failed. But we found out that almost 70% of their audience is mobile, right? Really? Okay. Yeah, and it's like, oh, okay, but are we looking at the same things, right? Are we making the choices? You're looking at statistics, right? But are we diving down into those statistics to really? Are we getting into a granular enough level where we actually understand what we're looking at? Right, a hundred percent. And you know that. So I mean, those are some examples. You know, and, okay. and yes, it definitely happens. And and sometimes it, there is a need to change for sure. There's no question about it. Um, because like I said, it's you know, there's not a one size fits all. You know, for right. an LMS, right? Um, but there is, there are ways to take a look at how they're using it. And what is the path of least resistance, right? And what, uh, from a business case, what makes sense? Okay. Well, and I, and the reason I asked if you've actually seen and, and had this done successfully is because I do think, you know, going back to your, to your comment about how, you know, sometimes the, the decision has already been made, we need to replace the system. And it's like, mm -hmm. How did we come to that conclusion, right? How did we come right. to that conclusion? Is that really the right conclusion we should have came come to? And and did we explore well what could we do with it? Because I don't think it's always taken into account the time and resources associated with making a major system change. And you know, especially when you consider the back end side of it. You know, if it's like, well, if ultimately you're buying a new system. <laughs> to create a cooler front end for your end user, that may be a very time consuming, expensive investment for something you may be able to solve through other channels. 
That's right. No, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And and looking at uh, their decision making process and what what influences and how they're weighting their their various decisions uh, as well, and where do they come from? Uh, in some cases, I've seen organizations where they just don't like the vendor, right? They just, I just yeah. don't like them, right? I don't like the people <laughs> I talk to, right? Okay, yeah. well, that's great. Let's let's just, can we just get you a different rep, right? Um, <laughs> right. I honestly, it's it's funny you bring that up because I actually had a conversation a, a little while back where it was we changed the trajectory of where things were going because it was something that simple. It's like, so you don't like your sales rep. So you're going to go through a multi-million dollar implementation and abandon right. a system that overall is serving you pretty well. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense, sense yeah, yeah. or sense C E N T S either. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> it's expensive. Uh, yeah. You know, migrations in general are not, you know, are not something just to blink at. You know, it's, it's definitely something you have to take in consideration. You have to look at your historical data. You have to look at your, your audience. You have to look at um, how much content you need to move over. In some cases, there are LMSs that use proprietary content that are built inside of their platform that only their platform can utilize. And there may or may not be a way to convert it over into something that's more compatible like Scorm, right? Okay. Well, and that's actually so. Let's let's talk about that one a little bit because this is one <laughs> of the things. Well, no, because this is a legitimate risk sure. that I see yeah. organizations treading into sometimes without recognizing what they're treading into. In the sense that I understand the desire for a more integrated experience, totally understand that. And sometimes the path that that can lead people down, especially if they don't understand the technical implications implications of this is, mm -hmm. well, let's get that system that has it all. It has right. the built-in content. It has the built-in this. It has the built-in that. So basically, it's the panacea of, of what it is. And it makes it gives me a little bit of agita when that happens because I go, do you understand the implications? And to your point of what you just asked, do you even have the ability to disconnect this or access it through any other channel because there may be so much depth of, of integration that you actually can't untangle this. So you truly are committing to, you're committing to the experience. Right, no, absolutely, absolutely. And we find in some cases where uh, an organization may already make the determination that they're moving on from an existing LMS okay. and they're gonna move to a new LMS and they're, they're, they're drawing a line in the sand with the vendor and saying, we're going to be done by this time without going through the full exposure of what that means, right? And how okay. long it's going to take, right? So, and, you know, really analyzing all of their, the, the, the variables associated with it. So, you know, within an LMS, you have your your, your users, you have your content, you have your connectors to other types of content, you have your connectors to other types of platforms, like fleshing all and this And if out. you've done customizations on that, you have those customizations that are built into this now. That's right, that's right. And, and truly understanding uh, what their business rules are and does the new, does leaving the existing LMS solve what you're trying to do to mirror or to integrate your current business rules, right? Will okay. another LMS actually solve that? Or is there something else that we need to do, right? Okay. Well, and and I'm just, <laughs> again, I, I know this is kind of, I, I knew we'd kind of go down some interesting paths, but it, these, this is really important food for thought because mm -hmm. there is tremendous pressure on learning leaders right now to make a lot of these decisions, to pick the right mm -hmm. system, to build the right ecosystem. You know, do we keep our current LMS or LXP or do we go buy a new one and, and make the shift? And, and on paper, sometimes those decisions can look far simpler than they actually are when you get into it. And this is where you hear these just migration nightmare stories where someone says, I mean, I just thought I was switching LMSs only to find out. And, and one example of one actually that, that recently came up with somebody I know we were talking about, they had in many ways been grandfathered in to a lot of 
uh, like, like you said, legacy business process and security protocols. <laughs> and it was almost like disturbing the dead a little bit because now they were switching systems and they were now going, you know, this was now on their CISO's radar and this, they were, you know, doing a full, full, you know, in evaluation of the capabilities and suddenly all these things that they were like, oh, <laughs> we yeah. were kind of okay, but we, we just like kicked the hornet's nest now. And this is bringing Absolutely. up things that we really were not looking to bring up necessarily. 100%. Absolutely, hundred percent, and it's and it's it's really important for any sort of L and D professional to make sure that they have extremely close ties to IT and all aspects of IT, right? And even even as someone who's built, I've built over a couple hundred hours of content, and I always always make sure that, especially in the early stages, uh, when I'm talking, you know, fifteen years ago building content, where IT and some of the technologies didn't always jive. Right. Okay. Yeah, and no, um, right. And so the it was crucial that that the L and D professional always made sure that IT was their best friend. Because it, it, at at the end of the day, your stuff lives on their space. It right? does. And and yeah. so so really understanding that and having that partnership in there is crucial. And so you know, I encourage them to, you know, take them out to lunch every once in a while, send them a, send them a plate of cookies, do whatever, like make them happy. Right. And, and also have these open conversations about, you know, how do we make sure that we all coexist really well and we plan for succession. Okay. So, so let me ask you this because I will tell you inevitably, and I'm curious how you, how you integrate and work with these folks, because some of the stuff we're talking about, one of the things that, I mean, I remember in my early days of getting into this, there were a lot of things you, you don't know what you don't know, right? The unconscious incompetence where, I mean, we're, we're talking about things that some people would be like, I have no idea what you're even talking about, Where right? We're talking about API calls. We're talking about, you know, all these data validation things. And, and it, I, it's, I wouldn't even know what questions to ask. And I just think of one example that I, that I ran into personally. Here's, here's right. We all, sure. everybody tells their success stories. Here was one of my epic failures was Love. I was in an organization. We were implementing a new LMS and I didn't know there were different single sign-on protocols. I, I mean, to right. me, it's just, everybody talks about single sign-on like it's right. a thing. That's right. So to me, I'm like, yeah, they have single sign-on. No big deal. They said they have single sign-on. We need single sign-on. <laughs> <laughs> but we, what does that mean? <laughs> we got all the way down the path. Contract was like we were on the process of like it was about to launch and we hadn't done the single sign-on. And we got to this point only to find out the enterprise data architecture had a different single sign-on protocol than the vendor. Sure. And they were not compatible. And we're like, and now granted, we had IT in the conversations. I mean, we had all the right partners. And it was one of these, what are we going to do at this point? Because literally, we missed this. And I don't know how we're going to fix it. And ultimately, going back to your point of customization, mm -hmm. we had to customize an entire data architecture approach to actually change the way this data was moving across to authenticate. It was a nightmare. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and that comes up. I mean, it, you know, not only does it come up as far as like, you know, what and, and more so these days that there's, you know, you know, everyone's a, little more a lot of people using than SAML it and things it like that. It used to be However, an absolute mess. Right. But but at the same token, too, you know, one thing that had come up not too long ago was uh, and in the line of SSO is um, an organization had audiences coming from multiple SSOs. So the question is, does the LMS handle multiple SSOs? And so that's, wow. you know, that would be a question. And that's something that's very much alive today as a conversation. That right? is, especially, well, and again, mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about it at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, but you think about, you know, organizations who may be doing extended enterprise mm -hmm. or they may have contractors that authenticate off different things. And you, and you look at, how are people actually authenticating into this system? Right. And do they even have the ability to set up multiple multiple ways of doing that? And if not, 
this is that it, there's no choice but customization because you can't just say, well, make it happen because that vendor is not going to go. We're not going to build that for you. Right. I mean, that's not it's right. not a typical use case. No. And actually, this is I'll plug one of our, our applications. So we build subscription applications that are, that virtually bolt on to an LMS. Right. Uh, and one of the things we have a product called Gatekeeper and Gatekeeper okay. is a uh, a product that allows an organization to have a custom login interface. But we can handle multiple, you know, multiple connections or even where you're going to connect to. Right. So okay. we're, we become as the as the 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 name describes, we're the gatekeeper. We can manage okay. all that, right? And so those are some of the things that we've, we've come across. And as we come across them, we then build products on top of that. We're like, okay, hey, there's a need for that. How, do, how can we replicate that? There's this that? niche use case need in the industry Absolutely. that the vendors right. aren't necessarily going to say, this isn't big enough because we don't have enough customers doing it. But it That's is right. frequent enough that you go, I mean, this is a problem in the industry. Somebody needs mm -hmm. something to be able to do this. That's right. That's right. And that's, uh, that's some of the things that we do is we build these subscription products. We have, you know, other ones, we have a reward system product that we're able to take gamification points and put them into a wallet and allow them. And we work with a third party um, organization that has a global connection for servicing, serving rewards. Right. Okay. And we're able to do that. I look at this, you know, when we look at gamification, you know, I always typically look at, it's it's either transactional. It's like, hey, you do this and then you get this, right? And and that's yep. it. Or I look at, I use the example of ski ball, right? So you ever play ski ball? You go to the arcade yep. and oh, yeah. go ball, oh, yeah. through, right? And you get the tickets and you know the points, and you go up to the counter. Go and, to Chuck E. Cheese and you get the garbage that your parents are like. That's right. Yeah, we, we're seriously going to keep this in the house. I look absolutely, absolutely. I, I look at you know the kids have the armfuls of tickets, right? And they go up to the counter. So anyway, but I look at the ski ball, and that's the gamification point. So how do we leverage that? So we have a connector that we can go ahead and do the connectors and have a virtual wallet that allows an organization to provide rewards that they wouldn't there, maybe their LMS doesn't provide that. Okay. Well, and I my headset's doing that stupid thing again, or it's muted me randomly. But um, it is one of those, we talked about this backstage where gamification, because again, we talked a little bit use cases. You talked about NVIDIA and the way they needed to integrate live streaming. But to me, gamification is one of those use cases where you go, every enterprise has some sort of rewards and recognition system in place today. Right. Something, whether people can, you know, they get things like that. And a lot of LMSs have started saying, well, we'll build a gamification or a leaderboard or some sort of capability, you know, into this. And a lot of times it is almost this disconnected. Okay. So I got a bunch of imaginary points. I just think of Drew Carey, you know, on whatever, where he gives out like make believe points for how they do their, you know, these high yeah, thousand, you know, and you're like, what is this? I mean, people aren't, <laughs> people aren't necessarily, you know, and then we're wondering, we're like, see, gamification doesn't work. And it's like, right. doesn't work. You didn't offer them anything. You gave them a bunch 100%. of make-believe points that have absolutely zero value in the organization. Oh, they can get a learner badge. Well, what does that translate to? Nothing. That's right. So I think that is one of those really good use cases where you go, okay, so how do we better integrate into our recognition capability and again we talk a lot in our industry about how do we make how do we reward and incentivize learning well mm -hmm. you're not going to do it by creating your own ecosystem of things that really the rest of the orgs like yeah i don't i don't care about your your leaderboard because it doesn't mean anything to me right right no no absolutely and 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 maybe we'll get on a call another another time and and just kind of talk about it but the from my perspective and from someone who's been building e-learning content for so long, the, the challenge has not changed. The challenge at a very, very base level for e-learning is how do you make the intangible tangible, yeah. right? And that's where we get in the conversation on gamification. Right. And that's totally aligns with what you just said in regards to the points. Hey, they're make believe points, but they're still make believe. Right. Yeah. Why do I care any more about make believe points? Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, well, and this just goes back to what we've been saying about when we say learning in the flow of work, mm -hmm. we say it, 
but then yet we create our own island and then right. wonder why it doesn't work. And it's like, well, you're, right. but then we're blaming the wrong thing. And, and again, to be clear for folks who, who have made it this far in the conversation, this is not to say every single thing needs to be customized. And I think even just from your perspective, I've seen you say like, no, not every single thing needs to be customized. You don't need to customize everything because somebody said, oh, well, wouldn't it be great if we could move this box to that? Like, okay, come on, it's probably fine. Right. And I do think in some ways the pendulum swinging away from total customization has been positive because it's made, I think even just listening to you, it's made people think more critically about where is customization adding real value and That's where right. is it noise and just adding complexity we don't need. Right. But I think it is one of those things that, you know, listening to you talk about this, if you're looking at some of these problems, there really isn't anything you can't theoretically do. That's right. You can do it. It's a matter of, is it worth the investment? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And also one other thing to, to point out is that customization doesn't always mean front end either. Right. That's right? true. That Well, and that's just it. I think that's another point. Finish your thought on that, because I think that's another before we run out of time is a point to at least kind of highlight. I think a lot of times customization is focused on front end, front door, pane of glass. And it's like, well, right. yeah, yeah, but that's not it. Sure. No, absolutely. I mean, an organization may have a certain template approach to things right. that that they just want to continue on. And maybe that template approach is integrated with other aspects of their business, right? True. And and if we change that, how much does that actually cost them, right? Uh, as far as errors, as far as misinformation, as far as payroll to manage this, you know, do I have to have five other people now to, to manipulate this data so I can get it back in the way that I want it to, right? Uh, yeah. Or can we build a, a mechanism to reorchestrate it on the back end? You know, how, how wonderful would it be that an admin had every piece of data that they ever needed at their fingertips? Well, I just even, again, we, we, hear, we could just keep going on this, but sure. I just even think of gatekeeping, right? Your gatekeeper mm -hmm. thing. There are organizations and you're out there. I know you're listening, watching, you know who you are. You have people whose job is to consolidate Excel spreadsheets of things to then put into the LMS to authenticate people's credentials. And these are, do I mean, these are headcount. These are resources, hours spent, or even not a dedicated headcount. Some poor sucker on your team has been tasked with this job and they hate it, but their job is to like consolidate the thing that comes out of work day and go, well, this doesn't work in the way I, so we got to freaking remove these tables and columns and do all this. And I got to reformat it just to hit upload into this. That's a lot of time and resources that, yeah, no, maybe the end user doesn't see that, but that's dollars and cents. You're spending every single month, every single year on things that are adding minimal value. And you may be doing it not knowing that, oh, you mean we could build a customization that would take care of this for us without having to think right. about it? I mean, it's it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, automation. And, and, and another day we can also get into AI and t talk a bit about that too. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and how, how automation and AI are being leveraged in the learning space to really make a more efficient use of what we're delivering to our audience. Well, and I, and I think the point, and then we'll close on this with the AI that can be a little bit terrifying yeah. is when people start treading into the AI territory and they haven't they haven't cleaned this stuff up. And they're like, oh, AI mm -hmm. will fix this for us. And it's right, like, whoa, right, whoa, right. like, no, 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 don't throw a machine at something that's a hot sure. mess. It'll just make, it'll just make that dumpster fire burn that much hotter, that much bigger if you, if you don't take care of it. So Absolutely. anyway, agree. this was, you know what, if, hopefully for folks who are watching and listening, I, I, again, I could geek out on some of this stuff probably far longer than I, than the hour the show would allow. But um, I appreciate you making the time because I think, you know, one of the biggest takeaways for folks is there isn't anything you can't do. And I think that's one of the things that's really impressive with tech anymore. Is some of these things where you go, well, you just can't. We're limited. And well, no, you can. It's a matter of whether you should or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that opens the door for things. And I think the other one is there may be a lot of things that you're doing today 
that you may actually be able to solve for much more efficiently and um, at probably a lower cost if you actually were to start doing the numbers on what you're spending on this. Anything else you'd um, add to that? I, I, I would just, the only thing I would add is, is that, uh, you know, are you utilizing training, training departments, L and D departments are always slim, right? And so yes. understanding how your resources are being leveraged is crucial. And to be able to offset some of those responsibilities onto something that could be automated to allow your resources to do other things that you need that department to do in order to grow is definitely worth looking at. Yeah. Well, and I think the point of taking the critical thought and time that you just demonstrated, similar to what we do with instructional design to say, let's actually talk about what we're gaining out of this and what the business case is and some of these things. And and it may not be as expensive as you thought. You know, yes, if your use case is, wouldn't it be cool if we could make the background pink instead of purple? Like, well, that mm -hmm. may not necessarily garner a ton of attention. But if it's, well, here's some stuff we're spending this many resources on and things like that, well, then that's a different story. Or we truly have a customer experience and we need to build our brand experience consistently across our, our enterprise. Well, then, yeah, then that is a conversation worth having. It is. I totally agree. Yeah, it's been okay. a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure, Rob. I appreciate you making the time today. And I know it's we had to we had to move it once before and it's been a while, but now we finally had the conversation. So thank you uh, for those of you watching and listening. Hopefully this at least changed your way of thinking a little bit about the whole debate between customization, configuration and actually what's possible um, today. So thank you for the time, Rob, and I hope everyone has a great week. Thank you.